turned off so you can't hear people popping in and it will, so it won't interrupt you. Uh, we had planned to have Tom Stewart with us today, and Tom did, in fact, prepare the presentation, but unfortunately, he had to call me this morning and tell me he is so sick he could not barely talk. So we've got Derek Christian pitch hitting for, uh, for Tom today. Um, sure you know Derek is a fantastic marketing brain uh, in general, but also specifically for the cleaning industry, bringing that uh, expertise from Procter & Gamble into uh, his own small business, uh, made, uh, my maid service in uh, Cincinnati, in Dayton, and in Dallas. So he's got the Cincinnati market cornered and its outliers. He hopped to Texas as well. He's a multi-state operation. Um, We've got folks continuing to join us, um, but we want to make sure that we honor your time that you are so generously giving to us today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Derek to get started. We've got calculating your marketing return on invest investment. Derek, take it away. Great. Well, and like uh, Cece said, um, Tom Stewart actually put this presentation together, so I'm going to talk about Tom a little bit first. Um, for the, those who don't know, Tom is... Uh, one of the co-owners of Castle Keepers of Charleston with his wife Janice. Um, he was, I believe, the first president of Arcs, if not the first, the second, one of the first two. Um, and he has partners with me and Cleaning Business Today and Cleaning Business Builders along with Liz. And has been a leader in doing chemical-free cleaning. And is basically the person you want for basically anything technical or system-wise. So Tom did some great spreadsheets here that I'm going to get to present. Um, and look really smart, but these are all actually his tools. I didn't add a slide for me, but CC already did a brief introduction. Um, I used to work at Procter & Gamble for 13 years before I uh, bought my maid service in Cincinnati. At the time, it was about $200,000, $250,000 a year in revenue, and now between the three offices, we're up to about $2.2 million in revenue. So it's been an interesting uh, seven years, and uh, we're growing pretty fast again. We slowed down a little last year, but all of a sudden, things are going crazy again for us. So today's topic that we're going to be talking about is how to figure out what your return on investment of your customer is, your average lifetime value of a customer, and how to figure out your cost of goods sold. So if you can figure out if you're making any money at all, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's nice to actually make a little bit of cash. And then we're also going to talk about some upcoming events that are going on in the cleaning industry that you may want to hear about. So first thing, the formula for return on investment is when at first glance, relatively simple. It is the gain from the investment minus the cost of the investment divided by the cost of the investment. And I'll give you an example. Say you went out and bought a $1 lottery card, the scratch-off card, and you won $5. So your return from the investment is $5. Your cost of the investment is a dollar. Divide by the cost of the investment times 100. So your ROI on the investment of a $1 lottery scratch-off card that pays off $5 is a 400% return on investment. For every dollar you spend, that ends up with $4. So not a bad deal at the end of the day. Um, I would take most things that had a $400 return on investment day in and day out. Now that's pretty simple when it comes to lottery, the scratch a card where everything's a nice even dollar. But our business is simple as that. So there's a couple of ways you can figure out the return on investment for marketing. One of them is using the average lifetime value of a customer. And what we mean by that is figuring out over the total life of a customer, how much money are they going to spend with you. And it's not what we're talking about today, but you'll notice over here in the presentation, CC's put in a couple of links for you to some KPI presentations that we've done, one of which is a video right here that shows the lifetime value of a customer. And a couple of the videos we put together in a sitting out the 40 years and walk through the math packs to figure out the lifetime value of us. We also Derek, have another video. To, Derek, okay. I'm sorry Go to ahead. interrupt. We've got a lot of interference um, with your audio. You're breaking up a lot. Huh. Don't know what to do about that. <laughs> okay, uh, a little better now. I don't know if you were wiggling or anything. Yeah, I don't know. I'm um, on a regular phone line, but for those of you who don't know, Cincinnati's been under record cold. We're at about negative 12 right now, so uh, 
lot power lines and phone lines are falling over, or all over town, so we may have a little bit of bad luck where somebody's out there doing some work on some lines. So hope this is bearable to you. If not, let me know. Um, and I forgot to say this at the very beginning, and I should have started. I'm driving around. Uh, we have the call muted because I'm sure you've all been on these calls in the past before, and somebody starts having a conversation with somebody. Um, to ask questions, there is a chat feature uh, built into the uh, GoToWebinar uh, tool which we're using. Uh, use that chat feature to ask your questions. I should see them, but every now and again I miss them, in which case CC almost always catches those for me and will pass it back off to me. So Cece's going to go ahead and let me know if anyone comes in with any chat questions. I'm going to keep an eye out as well, but sometimes when I'm deep into the presentation, I don't notice them. So go ahead and send those questions in. All right. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. All right, so we've got these videos over here. This first video, number one, lets you figure out what the lifetime value of a customer is. And say, for example, that you clean your average customer 20 times a year at $100 a visit, and you keep that customer for three years, it's relatively reasonable that you're going to generate about $6,000 from that customer. That's what we Derek, mean by I'm lifetime. Gonna, Go ahead. I'm going to interrupt again. We've lost your screen. Are you still sharing? I'm still sharing. Just a second. We're having a great technical day today. I was going to say, this is a fun tech day. <laughs> I see it back now. All right, I didn't press anything, but I tried to reshare it. Welcome to the joy of technology. Sorry, like I said, the joy of negative 12 degrees. There's probably somebody outside working on a line in front of my building. Um, so number one over here is a video to help you figure out the lifetime value of a client. The second video helps you figure out what your percentage of payroll revenue is. So today on this call, we're not getting into those numbers. And the reason why is the call would take too long and would be all time consuming but they're going to be important for the discussion we're having in a second. So this is an example of a marketing campaign where we spent $6,000 in direct mail advertising. Let's say, you know, in my market, that would buy about 80,000 homes through Valpac. So you invested uh, $6,000 to be in Valpac mail that goes to 80,000 homes. Out of that, you gain five recurring clients. The average lifetime value of a client for you is twenty is five thousand dollars, and your percent payroll as a percentage of revenue is forty five percent. So, if in this example you spend six thousand dollars, you get five customers that you can expect to spend five thousand dollars with you over their lifetime, and it costs you about forty five percent of every dollar that come in to actually clean the house. Is that a good return on investment? That's an interesting question. So one of the things we've done for you is we're going to provide a ROI calculator. So we put into this ROI calculator that we spent $6,000 on that direct mail piece. We got our five new clients generating $5,000 of lifetime revenue. Now, once again, here was a video that helped you figure out how you're going to figure out the lifetime value. And then your payroll percentage to revenue percent, which means for every dollar of revenue you generate, what percentage of that goes out the door for payroll for the people who physically clean things? It then lets you figure out what your direct payroll costs are, what your average gross profit is, and your total gain on the investment, and then figures out your return on investment. So in this example, for every dollar that we spend, we get back about 129% or $1.29 back return on investment. The math on this is pretty simple. It's basically saying we're going to generate, out of the example that we go through here, about $2,550 per client cost to actually physically clean the house, about $2,750 per client in gross profit. And what gross profit means is literally the money that you keep at the end of the day after uh, you pay the cleaners. And then what's your total gain from the investment? So in this example, we generated five clients. So in total, we're going to generate $13,750 off of our $6,000 investment. So we are a little better than doubling our money. We're putting in $6,000. We're generating back 
about 13,750. Now one question which we get a lot is what is a reasonable return on investment? 129% sounds pretty good. And I would tell you I will probably invest in anything that generates me 129% all day long. Um, in general, I like to theoretically double my money in business. Um, so I want to see an ROI on most things that I do of 100% or better. And the reason why is because we're talking about what's called gross profit here, which is basically how much money do we make after the cleaners are paid. We do have some overhead expenses associated with that that are probably going to go up. Now, theoretically, your overhead doesn't move in lockstep with your cleaning revenue. You know, when you sell three extra clients, you don't need to hire an extra person in the office. But at some point, you're going to have to. If your business gets big enough, you're going to need to invest more in overhead. You're going to need to invest more in other things. So I personally like to aim for an ROI of about 100% or better. So that, and 100%, by the way, doesn't mean I get my money back. It means I double my money. So for every $6,000 I put in, I get my original $6,000 back, and I get another $6,000. Now, an example of an investment that might not work out is if I did this direct mail piece and I only got back three clients, you can see that that's got a 38% return on investment. What that means is I'm spending $6,000. I'm getting $8,250 uh, back. Now, $6,000 of that's my expense, so I'm really only making $2,250. I personally am not comfortable with that, and I probably wouldn't make that investment because there's not a lot of margin for error in there. What happens if somebody breaks something? What happens if uh, something happens and you, it's pushed you over the edge of needing to uh, get another office person or another field inspector? Um, I typically want to see an ROI of 100. The other reason why is results tend to fluctuate. If I invest in a lot of things that have a low return on investment, um, you know, it may have worked the first time, but then it doesn't work on the second, the third, the fourth go around. If I'm seeing at least, uh, and I say 100, I might even do an 80% ROI, but if I'm seeing an 80, 90, 100% return on investment and I go out there and make an investment and it turns out not to work out and I don't get as good results next time as I did the first time, I'm probably still at least making a little bit of money. But I don't like to make a little bit of money. I like to basically double my money. I like to put whatever I come in, put in, at least come back out and double it for me. Okay. That's the first approach to trying to figure out the uh, return on investment. It's the lifetime value of your customer. Now, that works really well if you are selling something like a reoccurring customer, something that's got ongoing reoccurring revenue and big numbers. But what if you're doing something small? What if you're doing something like uh, a leave behind for refrigerator cleaning? and you're doing a big campaign to try to generate more refrigerator cleaning. Or another example would be if you're doing a campaign for move-in and move-out cleans or steaming mattresses or a lot of one-time revenue opportunities that we have in our business. Um, a better way sometimes to do that is the cost of goods sold approach. So for example, in this approach, if I'm investing $250 in a flyer for refrigerator cleaning and five people buy into the refrigerator cleaning, and I charge $40 per refrigerator cleaning, and it costs me, on average, $6 to clean that refrigerator, which is just me going out and saying, okay, so it's going to take my people half an hour to clean the refrigerator. My fully loaded lab cost is $12 an hour, so I am going to spend $6 to clean that refrigerator to generate $40. Sorry, we're trying to this. She didn't lose around on me. We've got another tab for you which helps you figure out the return on investment just doing a project-based thing. So here's our example again. I'm going to spend $250 in flyers and maybe an incentive for my cleaner for whoever sells the most of my refrigerator cleanings. Um, I believe we said we're going to sell five refrigerator cleanings. We generate $40 per refrigerator cleaning, and it costs us an average of $6 to clean each refrigerator. You can see that I'm going to spend about $30 in labor and generate about $170 in gross profit, so I'm going to lose about 32%. So I'm going to spend $250, and I'm going to get back $170, or I'm going to actually lose $80 to do this activity. And that's not taking into account um, how much time, effort I am spending personally because my time is worth something. 
So this example of a refrigerator cleaning incentive that we end up only selling five refrigerator cleanings is probably not a very good return on investment. And you know, we may look at this at first and say, oh, it's pretty, it's pretty cheap. All we're going to do is offer a $150 bonus to whichever cleaner sells the most refrigerator cleanings. And I'm going to spend some money on some flyers. I'm going to spend some money promoting on Facebook. Well, if you don't sell, if you only sell five jobs, you're not even going to get your money back. So what I can do now is sit in here and do some what-if calculations and say, all right, so I'm going to spend this money doing this program. What happens if I sell 10 refrigerator cleanings? Okay, if I manage to sell 10 refrigerator cleanings, I'm going to get back $340 for my $250 investment or 36% ROI. I'm going to make $90. Well, that's an awful lot of activities for $90, Derek. I don't know. What if I got sold 20 refrigerator cleanings? All right, if I sold 20 refrigerator cleanings, I would get 172% ROI, which sounds good. But once again, I'm going to generate $680 of gross profit. I'm going to spend $250 maybe on, once again, this isn't just printing costs. I'm assuming I'm throwing in some money for incentives for my cleaners, things like that. I'm going to make $400. Depending on the size of your company, $400 may or may not be very exciting. Um, I think you heard at the beginning of the call that we've got about a $2.2 million business. $400,000 isn't going to get us very excited around here. So we would sit here and do this calculation and say, you know, it's an interesting idea, but it's not worth, worth the time and effort. Now we could go in here and come up with some other ideas and say, okay, what if instead of doing the refrigerator cleaning, we did a spring clean upcharge or a spring clean uh, incentive where the cleaners are out there selling a full spring clean upgrade. We typically charge about an extra $150 for spring cleaning, and typically it only costs us about $70 to do that work. So I can generate a much better return on investment if instead of selling refrigerator cleaning, I actually go out there and try to do something like a spring cleaning um, incentive. The numbers get a lot more interesting. Not only does the ROI get better, but the total gross profit gets better. Because it's not always just about the return on investment. Because at the end of the day, you can have a great ROI because something is cheap, but you still only have so much time and effort that you can invest in things. So you need to look at the total gross profit. Because if you spend all your time and money chasing little ideas, you're not going to have the time to go out there and chase the big ideas that really move the needle and cause big things to happen for you. Now, we are sending a uh, email to everyone who's on the call after this uh, presentation that has these Excel spreadsheets. And as I showed on the first tab for the first spreadsheet, we do have links embedded to the videos that help you figure out the average lifetime value of your client and what your percentage payroll to revenue cost is. And so you can fill this out and play with these and do some what if calculations on your own. All right. Back to my presentation. So a little bit of a challenge for you. Um, using the attached spreadsheets, you can play some numbers and figure out what your ROI for your campaigns are for things that are trying to sell your recurring uh, clients. You want to use your cost of good marketing spreadsheet for your project work, your move-in cleans, your move-out cleans, construction cleans, your refrigerator cleanings. Those two little spreadsheets will help you figure out your return on investment on those type of marketing activities. You want to continually measure and improve your ROI by doing continuous improvement. There are ways you can make things work better. You can measure and say, what would happen if I tweaked it? Um, I'll give you a, a specific example of what we did here in Cincinnati. For years, I used to run an offer that was $100 off your first time cleaning if you booked biweekly or weekly service. And I ran that offer for years. It worked great. It was a fantastic offer for me, and uh, through direct mail primarily. And over the last couple of years, the results have been dropping, dropping, dropping. I was getting fewer and fewer people coming in. And once again, I'm going to go back to the Excel spreadsheet so they can kind of see what this looked like. So it was a direct mail piece that cost me about $6,000. And I used to get, you know, I, and I'm 10 clients from it. I'm not exaggerating on that. It would be great. I would offer people $100 off. So I'd spend $6,000 in direct mail, and I had a $100 off offer. Well, over time, that started to drop. And recently, I was only getting three clients every time I did this offer meaning only 30% return on investment, which is very exciting for me. Um, as I mentioned, I don't like to play with anything that's under 100 or at least darn close to 100. So I decided I was going to discontinue my agreement 
but the nice folks at Valpac convinced me into doing another agreement with them, but changing it. So I changed the offer from a hundred dollar off with first time cleaning to instead I said fifty percent off your first five hours. By the way, I charge thirty two dollars an hour, so fifty percent off your first five hours is actually eighty dollars. It is less money than the hundred dollars. But all of a sudden when I changed that offer, I jumped back up and started booking twelve clients again. So by changing that offer, I went from a thirty eight percent return on investment to a four hundred and fifty percent return on investment, and the only thing I did is change the offer. There's a couple reasons why I think that happened. Um, first of all, seven years ago when I was offering the hundred dollars off first cleaning, nobody else on my market was doing that, and it really stood out and people noticed it. Well, over the last seven years, as we got bigger and bigger and bigger, and people noticed what we were doing, a lot of my competitors began to copy that hundred dollars off offer, but they also began to play games with it. Uh, a couple of the uh, other larger companies in town would do things like hundred dollars off if you sign up for weekly or biweekly service. But then there'd be a little asterisk, and if you read fine print, it said twenty dollars off your first, third, fifth, you know, seventh, and ninth cleaning. So they were giving twenty dollars off every other visit. So people started to get jaded towards that hundred dollars offer because of what competition was doing in the market. So when I changed it fifty percent off your first five hours, people got it. I'm not playing games with you. This isn't a hundred dollars off, and I'm going to string you out over a year to give it to you. I'm going to take fifty percent off right away. And just changing that one thing on the offer kicked up my return on investment. The other thing we kicked up my return on investment is I took the offer, and it used, I used to have this beautiful, I, I should have thought about this and pulled it up, but my uh, coupon was a beautiful coupon. It had my company colors logo, and in my company colors, I had the offer, $100 off you know, your, if you book biweekly or weekly service. Well, I decided to do something a little bit different and said, you know what? And my colors, by the way, are blue and green. So I said, you know what, why don't you, uh, blue, green, and yellow, actually, excuse me, I have three colors. And I said, take that offer and make it pink, because there's nothing in my ad that's pink. All the colors I use are blue, green, and yellow. Take that offer and make it bright, bright pink. And so I had this hot pink offer, and it looked ugly as heck. You know, my graphic designer was crying a little bit inside. She's like, you want me to do what? But it's so ugly. But my return on investment, went up by 35% when I did that. And the reason why is because it now jumped off and screamed at people. And when we worked at PG, we used to call that a violator. And what a violator is is something that does just that. It violates the flow of the ad. It jumps out at you. It's like when you're in the grocery store and you see that little button that says, new and improved. That's a violator. It's normally obnoxious. It's normally got an obnoxious color. So by doing the pink, I put a violator in which made the offer jump off the print coupon and got me a better return on investment. So play with it, track it over time, and see if you can get better returns on investment. If it doesn't work, try something new and keep moving on. Because this business is all about incremental tweaks. If you get a 5% increase on your return on investment with one idea and 5% from another, next thing you know, you're more serious. Okay? We already talked about the resources that you're going to get the Excel workbook coming to you immediately after the webinar. And you've got the publicly available videos on Cleaning Business Builders uh, website out there. For you. So let me open my little Q&A window and see if I see anything. I am not seeing anything, Cece, but sometimes they send it just to host. Do you see anything? No, no questions have come in. OK, well, I like to say it's because I'm that good. But the next oh, thing we want to talk, yeah? Next thing we want to talk about is an event we're actually having here in Cincinnati, which we're calling our Extreme Marketing Makeover. Um, it's going to be in March, uh, March 13th through 15th here in Cincinnati, and I'm really, really excited about this. Um, I'm kind of a marketing geek, and Cincinnati is a great marketing town. I don't know how familiar you are with Cincinnati, but not only do we have Procter & Gamble here, but we've got Macy's, we've got Kroger's, we've got a lot of very big consumer product companies. So. For the size of the city, we have more advertising agencies than any other city in the world. So we've got some experts coming out, not just me talking on this one. We've got a gentleman uh, coming out to talk about search engine optimization and how to make your website pop up at the top. Um, and he's not trying to convince you to buy his stuff. He's just coming out to share what he knows. And then a friend of mine from when I used to work at PNG manages the social media presence for the Yukonuba brand for Procter & Gamble. Actually, it's, excuse me, Mars. 
Uh, Procter & Gamble sold Eucanuba and Iams to Mars about nine months ago, and I'm having a hard time adjusting. Um, so she manages the Eucanuba social media presence. That means Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, et cetera. And she used to also manage the IMS website, but the Eucanuba got, website got so big that they gave that to her on her own. And we all like to think about how great our websites are. Hey, I'm up to 5,000 likes. How many likes do you have? The Eucanuba website, last time I checked, and by the way, there's actually multiples because they've got uh, event websites and such, had I think 370,000 likes and an average post, an average post, not a special post that went virus, viral, but an average post had anywhere from 50 to 250 likes and 3 to 15 shares. So she's become a really good expert on how do you create a social media presence that people actually read, share, like, and interact with. How do you create these online communities? Uh, we're going to be talking about how do you create trust online? How do you get people online to invest money with you? And by the way, these rules have changed. A lot of the things that used to work in the past don't work anymore. Things need to be simple. The consumers are now used to seeing things like bullet point lists, one, two, three, four. If you have a website, like mine, by the way, my website's out of the day, I'm relaunching it, that just drowns the consumer with information and it's brochureware, it's actually bad for you. You actually need to simplify it now and actually give the consumer less information, not more information. It needs to be simpler, more structured. Now, you can have information there for them to find on their own, but you don't want to push it all on them. And that's the type of stuff we're going to talk about. So it's going to be a pretty neat event. We're having it at the Wingate in Cincinnati. Um, we're going to have some of the great great speakers from national PR and marketing firms. Um, I believe early registration is over at this point, right, CC, or are we still doing early? Yes, uh, early bird has that ended uh, July. Sorry, July. January. January thirty first. So we are at regular registration price two ninety nine. Yep, but it's, um, it's a great event. It's a great event. Room at the Winget for eighty nine, but they they've got about eight rooms left in the whole hotel yeah. for that weekend. Yeah, and the rooms are only eighty nine dollars. It's a great hotel. Um, it's a great city. Uh, once again, you're not going to hear just the same old people. You are going to hear me, but we do also have some guest speakers um, from uh, different parts, uh, uh, different industries to come in and share some insights. And once again, people that do things in much bigger numbers than you and I are used to talking about. You know, idea of doing a Facebook post and having it get 1.2 million impressions. These are the type of numbers that some of these people get. And how do you do that? How do you break into that, those type of numbers? So we're really looking forward to it. We hope to see you there. Um, one last for questions. Does any more questions come in about the event or anything, Cece? It doesn't look like you're able to see them. Uh, Julie did ask a question. I gave her a little bit of guidance. Um, what kind of fine print or contract do you have with those clients picking up the offer um, that prevents them from taking you know, getting the $100 off the first time and then canceling the rest of their recurring service? How do you protect um, yourself? We don't. Uh, we take the risk. Um, we tell people over the phone that we ask that they let us clean for them four times, and by then, if they're not happy with us, then we give, they've given us a fair chance to prove to ourselves. Um, that being said, it, I've been doing it for hmm, between the hundred dollars off and now the fifty percent off seven years now, and I think five people have canceled service. Um, or not gone on and booked a regular service, and out of those five, I would say three of them had pretty good reasons. Um, you know, as good as I think I am, uh, things still happen to us. Uh, cleaners, you know, get called in the middle of a cleaning that their kid is sick. Uh, we break things, you know, and in some way or another, we let them down on the first clean. So only two of those people do I think actually tried to cheat me. Um, my cost of labor is about 40 to about 45 to 50 percent. So offering 50 percent off the first five hours means I'm not losing any money. So as long as I'm not losing money and they're giving me a try, I'm okay with it. I've really not had a problem with being cheated on it. The alternative, and this is something that Tom does um, uh, when he offers a similar kind of deal, um, is that those uh, it's a hundred dollars off. And what they do is take off $25 for each of those first four cleanings. So the first cleaning is $25 less than it would be normally. Uh, so they know the uh, they know the regular quoted price, and that's how uh, how he protects himself there. And that's yep. written into the fine print of the ad. So that's an alternative if you're a, a little less 
risky than Derek. <laughs> yep, in general, you'll discover I have some personal beliefs not one in this business agrees to. Um, I, as long as I'm not losing money, um, I'll take a hit on things like uh, potentially letting myself be cheated. Um, I'll discount customers to avoid bad reviews, even if I think the customer is completely full of it, um, just because I'm trying to avoid bad reviews. And one of my favorite sayings is I always like to say, uh, you can either be right or you can be successful. And if you feel the need to be right, you're not always going to win in this business. Um, sometimes you just got to suck it up, pay for the thing you didn't know you, you know you didn't break just to make sure the customer's happy. And uh, there was actually an episode of The Profit recently which I just was in love with and uh, Marcus Limonis actually said something really similar. Um, he was at a sign company and the guy got in a fight with a customer for not paying his bill. The customer claimed the sign was bad. And Marcus cut him off and said, you know, you don't have to try to make everyone happy in real life, but in business you do. And in business that means sometimes you have to take a pile of poop, put it in your mouth, and just shut up. And that's sort of what it's like sometimes in the business is you do sometimes let yourself be cheated, um, take the hit, but at the end of the day, you're going to win in the long run because you don't need to make enemies and make a big deal out of it. So anyway, my personal opinion. I don't have any more uh, questions that have come in, but I will say that ties back rather nicely, um, particularly to the lifetime value calculator, um, because it, uh, I think both of them do. I did, it helps you identify the lifetime value of that client. Uh, if, if it's a $300 breakage and you need to pay it, it doesn't matter who, wrote, who, who broke it or who's at fault if on the back end you're getting $5,000 out of that client over the course yep. of a year. So it ties back into uh, you to the ROI and some, some useful lessons there. Well, the um, other thing I think about is if somebody had written a flaming negative review for me online, would I pay $200 to make that review go away after the fact? Yeah, I would. So why not pay for it ahead of time to make it never be there? So. Very good. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, we had a nice, nice crowd, and uh, as promised, uh, in about uh, 30 minutes or so, I should have the video up on YouTube and the uh, the calculators in your email inbox. So be looking for those. They are awfully fun to play with, um, particularly as Derek showed some of the what if. Um, variation. Great tool when you are uh, presented with it. You take a cold call and it sounds like a really neat idea, pull out this calculator, plug in the numbers they're, they're quoting you and see if, uh, you know, what, what kind of return uh, would make it worth your while to, uh, to get that and then offers you a little bit of negotiating information um, you know, to go back with. So it can be uh, useful in a, a number of different ways, and, uh, not just uh, testing existing marketing programs. Um, so we hope you will enjoy that and look forward to, uh, to your feedback as well. And we'd love to hear what you learned from it and what you gain from it especially. Um, please plan to join us in, uh, in Cincinnati in the middle of March and uh, watch our newsletter that comes out uh, every other week uh, to find out what the next third Thursday at 3 webinar is going to be about. Um, it, it won't be about marketing. We've, got, we've done two marketing ones in a row, so I think we're going to take a little bit of a break. Um, but watch the, uh, the newsletter to find out what the next topic is and plan to join us third Thursdays at 3 every month. Um, so it's been great to, to have this time with you. Thank you so much for, your, uh, for loaning us your very generous time. And we will talk with you again next time. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.